how do I sound now? Does it? Very good. Sounds okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you sound okay. I have turned. Not your uh, usual dulcet tones on the Stellar X2, but <laughs> sounds fine. But I turned. So just to kind of give you a sense of it, there's a there's an AC unit here that I asked them to turn on. And that's uh, a Leeds building. Anyway, so um, uh, so I, I don't really hear it in my voice that much. I can hear a little bit of it, like a little bit of a cleft on my voice when I talk, but it doesn't sound too bad. If I open it up, so that's what the mic's picking up. Yeah, yeah. so you're doing noise assist, yeah. noise assist on it, yeah. And then that's... Your intelligibility is still very high, so you've got yeah. all the mids and tops. We try, just... try to do better than intelligibility. <laughs> do better. So I've turned it up a lot, but it, I think it's a... Uh, Pretty good there. Okay. All right. Have a great show, everybody. We're, what, two and a half out. I'm glad you're here, though, Alex. We had a lot of questions that I thought you'd be really good for. I wouldn't miss it. I'm really excited about the second hour. I'm excited about yeah. the first hour too, of course, but the second hour is uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, you landed great guests. Uh, Bo. Oh, Bo did that. Yeah, still, it's going to be fabulous. I think. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Great to have you here with us. If you're watching on YouTube, you can always find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is always a general discussion of production and IT-related topics where we answer your questions. Audience-submitted questions, you can 
give us a question on any topic that has to do broadly with production uh, related arts and uh, sciences. The second hour, typically a deeper dive into something that we want to examine more closely. Today is really exciting. We're going to do HDR glass to glass. That is a process of how is this HDR continuing rollout across, across the globe happening? And we're looking kind of at the top end of things today. We have Michael Drazen and Jim Tolan, both of them who are heavily involved in the continuing HDR global rollout rollout. Little projects like the Super Bowl and things like that, they'll be talking about that today. So it's a great day to learn about the continuing um, move uh, of the entire industry toward HDR workflow. So that's our second hour. To start out, we'll see what our viewer producers are interested in today. Courtney, I think you're reading today. So what, what have we got from our audience? All right. First up is from Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York. And he says, morning, everyone. I recently received a very pixelated low-res video for playback in a stream. Does the panel know of any plug-in or AI magic that could potentially up-res the video to reasonable, or am I asking for too much? Alex, take this on. Yeah, you're asking for too much. <laughs> so though, here's the issue is, is that when it's low resolution um, and it's, it's kind of everything's just low resolution and not pixelated, uh, there are tools that can do a variety of different ways of up those files. But when you start to get that pixelation, there are very few things. If it's really, I'm assuming from your question that it's really low res and really pixelated. And once you start getting what we call macro blocks in there, it is very hard to pull those out seamlessly. I think you're going to probably, I mean, you can add, try to add blur filters. You can try to do a variety of other things. But you're going to find that oftentimes your solutions are worse than the original. So I would re recommend either just blowing it up or putting it picture in picture inside of a larger screen and not try to go full res. Courtney Gooden? Well, here's a crazy idea. If it looks pixelated because somebody has taken a low res image and blown it up with a poor uh, enlargement software, in other words, it's just doubling pixels, you could try reducing it. Uh, back down to 720p if it was 720p or 480i first and then take an AI uh, 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 upreser and upres it back to 1080p. That may be what's going on here, but uh, and I don't know if it can undo the bad upres that has happened to it before you got it, but you might be able to unupres it <laughs> back down to its original resolution and then use AI to upres it again. That's your only hope, I think, of getting anything decent out. Yeah, my experience has been the same as Alex indicates. You know, you're taking a, a flat raster of a certain number of pixels, and if you're mapping them to a larger raster, the computer is basically guessing. Even good algorithms, you know, they can do the best they can with edge aliasing and, and trying to put it in there. But if you start with really low-res stuff, it's very hard to get a really satisfying picture out of that in the long run. That's why everybody is trying to shoot everything that we can with the highest res possible, keeping that and then down resing before we go through the post process. That'll make things much more future proof. And that old SD stuff, it just continues to look worse and worse to my eyes as we get into higher res as the standard. Let's move on to the next question. Next one comes in from uh, Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. He says, what would be your camera recommendations for a live stream graduation for a budget of $650? Would the Canon M15 Mark II work? There's a link. And we're starting with Samuel Nordvik here. Samuel? Yeah, well, the uh, Canon M50 should work, uh, but they're not developing that line anymore. So I would rather go for something like the, uh, this is an older camera it's the sony a5100 and i've got the uh, sony 18 uh, to 105 power zoom lens you can pick up the camera for about 200 250 dollars maybe and maybe the lens is new 600 but you can probably find it used and you can also plug this in uh, to you can also plug it into a remote control and uh, uh, control the, the zoom on the on the uh, uh remotely nice courtney yeah you're looking at me right now through a canon uh m50 mark ii so if you can still find one uh that would be a good choice you might want to put a little longer lens than the kit lens which i have on it depends on how close your camera is going to be to the stage to shoot the graduation so you might think about a little bit longer lens if you're going to be stuck at the back of an auditorium or something um and you will have to get the uh, for streaming 
Uh, mine works fine because we go hours and hours here and it never times out, gets hot or overheats. Um, but you do have to get the battery eliminator. So it has a little battery plug that will uh, replace the internal battery and give you an outlet that you can plug into uh, a source of, I think it's five volts or seven volts, I forget. But you're going to have to run it off of AC for that long period of time. So uh, whatever, if you are using a DSLR, take that into account. Alex. Yeah, and, and, and think about whether you are going to use the camera a lot. So uh, if you're not, if you're really getting it for this wedding, also think about renting. You can go to something like Borrow Lenses and rent for a couple hundred dollars. You can get a really good camera and a really good lens uh, that's going to do a, a much better job than anything that you're going to buy for $650. But if you think you're buying it and they're going to use it over and over and over again, then go ahead and, and get something. I think that the Sony's under 650 uh, some of the used ones, exactly what Samuel had recommended those types of cameras work really well the autofocus can, is really good um they've got good short depth of field there's a bunch of those those things that are probably the best bet in that price range um but what i would say is i think really hard about renting a good camera um you can there's all kinds of whether it's black magic cameras or sony cameras or canon cameras for a couple hundred dollars you can run them for seven days and you can get a, a good lens or a couple lenses for seven days all inside of that budget or, or potentially less and then you have, you're going to get better footage. So that show will be better. And the question is, is, or do you want to invest in a camera that you're going to use? But just really think hard about that before you, before you buy. Good advice. Let's move to the next question. Next one comes in from uh, Chris Wadner in uh, Lafayette, Indiana. He says, anyone checked out the Multicam Studio for LumaFusion yet? And he has a link to it. Yeah, I'm very interested in it. Alex, do you have any experience? You know, I haven't, haven't played with it yet. I'm really excited to, to test it out. I'm hoping to test it out actually this weekend um, just to try to put put it together. I have LumaFusion on my on my laptop. I've been, you know, I use that on the road. And uh, so I'm hoping to be able to test it um, soon in the next couple of days. Uh, it looks really interesting. I think it has an auto switching uh, feature too for multicam. And I'm really interested to test that out, but we haven't played with it yet. Is that driven by sound? So that when somebody speaks, it I auto think so, switches yeah. to them? Yeah, I, yeah think it's, I, think, I think, but we don't know for sure just yet. Yeah, that'll be that'll be fascinating. Well, you know, and that 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 whole part of the industry is heating up now that Apple's doing their remote iPad thing. Mm -hmm. Luba Fusion's been around for a long time, so it's going to be really interesting to see if this drives that whole uh, mobile editing part of the industry forward a good junk. That'll be really yeah. exciting. And I don't think, That's, you know, I think yeah. that for, by the way, I, I don't think that a lot of people that are using LumaFusion are necessarily going to go to Final Cut because there's a lot of features that it has and a lot of the user, you know, people have been asking me this a lot as Final Cut was released. I don't, I just don't think you're going to see a big jump from Luma, LumaFusion to the iPad version of Final Cut. But I do think that obviously Apple's going to bring in a lot of new people into that. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see where LumaFusion goes in the next uh, couple of years. Yeah, and just editing on iOS as a mobile thing, it, it, this should drive continued innovation in that, and that's good for everybody. Yeah. So moving on to the next question. All right, next up is Alexander Knight from Vancouver, British Columbia. He says, for those with the Roland UVC-02 encoder, firmware version 2.0.1 has just been released with improved color conversion to USB stream. Anyone with scopes able to do a before and after comparison? Alex? Yeah, we haven't been able to do that yet, but what, I, what I'm going to guess is that the black levels look better, <laughs> you know, and, and I think that that's usually where they dig into it and some of the contrast ratios. And so it'll be interesting to see what that actually looks like. Um, this is an important thing when you see them kind of working through this. A lot of times we, we find that there's HDMI to, to USB-C converters and all kinds of other things at different price points. But we have to remember that, that, that all chips are not made equally. And so uh, we are going to have in the near future have a breakdown where we take a bunch of these different encoders and we plug them all in and see, you know, what, what is the actual, what are we actually seeing um, on scopes and visually. It's hard to show on, on Zoom, so I'll have to post it somewhere for people to look at. But basically, um, what's happening in these conversions, whether it's Blackmagic, uh, Roland, but also many of the little pieces that we can buy. Interesting. Next question, please. Coming in from uh, Rob Bullock in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. I have a Mac Studio and three monitors. I also have an HP laptop that I want to use with one of those monitors at times. Is there a switch I can buy to seamlessly go from running all three monitors with the Mac to one of those monitors with the laptop? Courtney. Uh, 
Yeah, you, you need an AB switch that supports HDMI, probably. I'm assuming the H, there are HDMI inputs on those monitors. Um, there's I found one on Amazon that's called a Benfei, F-E-I, B-E-N-F-E-I, that has two switches, and it's bidirectional, so you can take two in to one out or one out to two in. So you can use it either way, and it has a little push button to switch back and forth between the two. Make sure you get some one that's a, a switch and not a splitter, because going one way, it's a splitter. Going the other way, it's a switch, or it's not really a splitter, because it only outputs to one at a time. But um, going the other way, it's a switch, too. So you got to make sure it will switch between the two and not just work as an amplifier. But that one's 10 bucks on Amazon. It should probably work well for you. Alex? Whoops, you're muted. Sorry, on the road. Uh, if you want to scale up a little bit and make sure that you can do a lot of different things in the future, look at matrixes as well. HDMI matrixes, black um, mono price makes a couple. I have an eight by eight, but they make smaller ones. I think there's a two by two and a four by four. And that's going to let you, you know, the four by four, for instance, would allow you to have both computers go into it along with the all the monitors. And then you'd be able to sit there and just switch between whichever monitor or computer you want. So if the HP wants to have all three monitors, or and you can set those as presets, and so you can just hit a button and they'll just jump to the HP for all the monitors and then jump to it. Now that's a more expensive solution than what Courtney recommended, um, but that's what I do. <laughs> so, yeah. So and just out of my personal experience, I tried for a little while to do an HDMI passage switch like that, but it was running into my ATEM Mini. And I have to say, the ATEM Mini did not like the switch. I don't know whether it lowered the levels on the signals coming in just enough, but it was really hard to get the ATEM to clamp onto that video signal and use it once I ran it through the switch. So I eventually had to pull it out. So just, you know, it's an inexpensive way to test, see if the workflow happens, but test it often and, um, you know, in all the conditions you'll be using it under before you go live with something like that, because they can be a little problematic. It was for me. Let's go to the next question. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just tag on the end of that and just say that it was, uh, it pulls its power from the HDMI cable. So, uh, because it doesn't have a separate power input, the one that I showed. So take that into account. Uh, it may not have enough power coming out of your yeah. uh, Alex, did you screen. want to follow up? Oh, no. That was the next question. Yeah. I can do the All next right. question here. Yeah. Go ahead. From Funsak Dorji in Dharamsala, India, he, India, he says, Greetings. For video playback, I've used a VLC, and of late, I saw a video playback feature on H2R graphics, which can be controlled by a stream deck. There's also Playout B. Which one of uh, these three does the panel prefer and why? Courtney, start us off. Well, I prefer my own, but but if if because I wrote one over a period of about ten years, it does everything I wanted to do. But I I imparted a lot of those uh, requirements on Jonas when he was uh, uh, designing Playout B, and so a lot of the things that I I liked in a Playout uh, device, he put into Playout B, thankfully, and so it runs on uh, uh, either a um, Raspberry Pi or on Windows or a Mac in a in a browser window. So it works pretty well for me. And it can be triggered from an ATEM as well, since it supports the playout protocol of the uh, Blackmagic uh, players. So that's probably the one I would use. I have not seen the H2R graphics, maybe Alex has. Alex? No, I haven't. I haven't actually played with the HDR graphics that much. I have done VLC, and I wouldn't use that as a playback unless I had to. Uh, it's not really built for that. It's built to play movies, and people use it for that. And it's definitely you're not alone in that area of using VLC for a playback system. But I wouldn't uh, recommend that. I would definitely recommend going to something like Playout B or HDR graphics. Now, um, I think you know the one that we have the most experience with is Playout B because Jonas is part of the community here. John is as well, so John Barker that does H two R graphics. So it's very complicated here, um, you know, to talk about these. But but I have I don't have the experience with H two R graphics, and we have used Playout B quite a bit. And the fact that you can scale it down into a Raspberry Pi or a very you know uh, you know is pretty useful if you can get a hold of one of those. So uh, and it takes uh, if you're working with an ATEM, it you know ties all this not only to the stream deck but all to the ATEM protocols as well. So you can fire it straight from a uh, switcher. Nice. All right, let's move on to the next question. Next one comes in from uh, Michael Marsh in uh, San San Anselmo. It says, can you recommend a standalone audio meter for our meter app for the Mac? Alex, what's your favorite? Yeah, Sonic Atom is uh, the one that from Loud Labs is the one that we use right now. Uh, in the past, the one that we 
still love is Spectre. Uh, Spectre is, um, is I think, now being sold again from Zenaptic. Uh, and so it, we may play with that again. But right now, in the last five years, we've really used Spectre, went through an ownership issue. And so, uh, so it kind of went into Never Never Land for a while. And uh, we all moved to Sonic Atom on the Mac. And, and um, Loud Lab does a lot of other things. They have Fluctus. And they have um, also uh, sound uh, or um, uh, sound desk, which uh, we've been talking about a lot as a software mixer for the Mac. So they've got a couple different features, and they, they've kind of worked really done a lot of great work there. And, and again, Sonic Atom is the one that we've uh, used the most in the last five years. Excellent. Hope that took care of you, Michael. Uh, let's move on to the, our next question. Next one comes in from uh, James Brooks in New York. He says, most of my video editing is done on a laptop, but occasionally I have the need for a quick edit out in the field. What iPhone apps would you recommend for quick video editing of iPhone footage? Alex, start us off. Whoops, you're muted again. Sorry, I'm not used to that. I'm used to having a little button that I can do that with. I might have to start carrying it with me. Um, so uh, <laughs> so anyway, the um, the... Uh, as far as as far as what what apps to use, the most popular ones are oftentimes the ones that are native for the app, whatever you're putting out in. So TikTok or CapCut or you know those are those are very popular in the TikTok world. Um, you can also um, look at um, iMovie as well as clips from Apple. Um, now that now Adobe has one called Rush, but we've never actually seen anybody use that in the in the field, and so uh, we've seen clips and 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 i and iMovie used a lot. Uh, when people are trying to to do those edits right on their phone. Uh, and laptop editing is something I've been doing for a long time. Uh, and a quick edit, I just opened up Final Cut because it's just so easy for me and I'm used to it now. And I would imagine that for the Premiere drivers out there, it's the same thing. Most of these apps run really well on a laptop, so it shouldn't be a problem. Courtney, your thoughts? I, I think he's looking for something to run on an iPhone. I was going to uh, wonder, they did, didn't they just release... Uh, for the iPad uh, Final Cut. So will it run on an iPhone since iOS? It's is still not? unreleased. It's coming out on the 23rd. Everybody okay. who uh, signed up said that they know it's, it's going to release on the 23rd. Right. So this yeah. coming Tuesday, we will know what it's like in the real world. And, and as soon as you go to something like an iPad, of course, you have LumaFusion, which is a very capable editing package that you can use on the iPad. And you have DaVinci Resolve. So there's a once you move, it, I answered the questions very specifically to the iPhone. Um, but once you go to the iPad, there's lots of, there, there's becoming more and more solutions to make that work. Yeah. Have you ever tried a LumaFusion on an iPhone, Alex? It, I know I it's very small. Yeah. I don't think it works. I don't think it, I don't, I don't think it loads onto an iPhone. Ah, okay. There you go. So some, I, I didn't realize that in iOS, I guess there's a sequester. You can run yeah, certain yeah. things. There's on some one things format. that just don't make sense on an iPhone. Yeah, that makes sense. And I would Pencil. imagine that trying to do that <laughs> even with a pencil would be very fiddly. Uh, all right. Let's move on to the next question. From uh, Sean Joe uh, Johnson in New York City, looking for a router that will bond and act as a fail-safe or rollover for two separate ISPs. Does such a thing exist? Samuel Nordvik, start us out here. Well, I don't have a lot of uh, experience with it personally, but I've used some enterprise routers, and uh, there's a lot of enterprise routers that will allow this. Uh, the Ubiquiti Secure Gateway, is one that I know that's been used successfully. Okay, Alex. Oh, mute it again. I'll, I'll get this. I'll figure out how to use it. It's high technology here. Um, the um, uh, yeah, the, the 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 one that we've used the most of them are, are the Meraki's. So in the Meraki, even in, in some of the smaller ones, the MX sixties and below, they have you can convert one of the in, the inputs to a. Uh, a a WAN, so you can have it has a WAN connection, but you can have another. You can add another imp, uh, one of the typical router settings as another WAN, as a second WAN, and it will flip over. Now it won't flip over seamlessly. Most of them don't flip over seamlessly, and, and the reason that they don't flip over seamlessly is because if it did that, it might jump too quickly, jump back and forth too quickly, and it and it could create some other instabilities. And so usually it wants to wait for a moment, a beat that it's not going to be on. And, and oftentimes there's a setting for that of how long it waits before it flips over to the other one. But you don't necessarily, you think you want it to be seamless, but that gives it a hair trigger and it can start going back and forth very, very often. And if it did that, you could end up with, um, you know, 
other instabilities. Um, the PEP wave will also do a do a failover um, to those things, and so those are those are a couple options. And it is possible, like what you really want is a device on the other end that is pumping out a primary and a backup and using those two different connections and trying not to do it in the router itself. Um, but if you do do it, uh, there's Ubiquity, Mar Meraki, as well as uh, PepWave will all do uh, what you're looking for. And as always, our expert panel is cranking through these questions. So thank you for adding all of them in. And don't forget, thank you for voting on them. It is the standard here at Office Hours that as the questions come in, everybody gets a chance to vote on them. Who's in the uh, producer panel there, uh, producer group. So you can vote things up. And as you do, the things that get the most votes are the things we get to quickest and spend the most time usually talking about. So get those questions in and vote on them. And we're also assembling a good number of questions for our HDR second hour. So you can participate in that too at the same time. Let's go to our next question. Next question comes in from Andy Carluccio in San Francisco, California. He says, good morning. Zoom ISO version 2.1 beta was just published. Anything interesting? Oh, it was just published and I didn't get a chance to look through it. Alex, have you got any idea what, what the team there at Zoom has been pushing or working on? Well, I I don't have a lot of uh, you know other than seeing it pop up here, um, you know. So the um, uh, you know what it's talking about here in the beta is that they're they're adding SRT, a new join flow, including Zoom event support, that which is which is useful, uh, more audio capabilities. I'm not totally clear of all of those yet, and they're also in, in having a new capture mode called live stream, which makes it easier to enable Zoom ISO in your meetings. And so so I think that these are going to be a lot of things that will just smooth out. Now, the SRT thing I'm particularly interested in, um, and uh, the um, but I but I think that there's a lot of a lot of things that are interesting. We're going to try to bring the we're going to have the Zoom team on uh, in a couple weeks uh, to talk about a lot of new releases, including this one. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be in a couple weeks, in two weeks from today, I believe. Yeah, and boy, both the Zoom platform and things like Zoom ISO are still just hotbeds of development. They are continuing to work very hard at these. And it's, you know, just from the outside, to watch this whole software development process take take over. People voted during the pandemic and, and in other circumstances that they wanted to be involved in this kind of technology and, and virtualize a lot of the shows that are being done in corporate communication and everything else. It's a huge industry. And boy, this has just transformed the way all of us work. We're here every day on a platform that is enabled, at least in part, by these exact technologies, the Zoom system and Zoom ISO and everything attendant to that. And to see them continuing, even though they've had such massive success and they've increased the number of people who are working with these tools logarithmically over and over again, uh, the fact that development is still going on and they're not satisfied and they're still pushing forward just, I think, bodes really well for the future of this as a platform. So uh, I'll be looking into it, and I'm sure a lot of people here will as well. Let's head off to the next question. Coming in from Dharamsala, India. Funsak Dorji says, hi, I remember seeing people using Zoom, I think, for simultaneous translation where people can choose the language of their choice to listen. How is it done? Alex? Yeah, so it's not automatic. So basically what, what we've done, at least not that I know of, um, so far what we've done with this is that, that you can set up interpreters in the back end. So that's a class of user that you can set up on the back end. You can send out inv invitations for them. And, um, and so the interpreters then hear it live and can speak into it. And the, the key is that people can listen to that, um, that they can click on and listen to that interpreter. They can choose what language they want to listen to. So there is an audio pipeline that is developed for that as well as a way to manage the interpreters so that you can put in and define what those interpretations are. So it's still people that are doing it for the moment. Um, and then it's, and then we're doing it. And I think that the world of, of interpretation is going to explode with, as we go into AI, where it's going to hear this, it's going to immediately push it out, translate it into 60 languages, make all of those languages available with uh, different voices. And I think that that's probably less than five years away. So there's a lot more that's going to happen here, but right now it's still a person on the other end listening and then speaking and, and driving it back into Zoom in real time. So you can look at it in the interpretation settings. And I'm one of those people who've been involved in voiceover for a long time. And there is a sub niche of this called re-speaking that uh, a lot of people are interested well, in that, and, that and re -speaking do these kind of translation. Than, than the translation. Well, I, yeah. Because re-speaking, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. I just 
respeaking to be specific is for captioning. And so, so you have, um, you have basically stenographers captioning. That's, that's the most normal way that we think about it. Of course, we have AI captioning and then we have respeaking and respeaking basically is in you're in a controlled environment with a good mic. You've trained an AI system to listen to you and you're literally just listening to the, listening to the show and speaking, respeaking into a microphone. Um, you're trained to speak correctly and it's kind of like learning to the didgeridoo or bagpipes or, you know, like those, those types of things where you're basically, one thing's going in and going out at the same time and you get good at, I've, I've talked to people who've done it, they just, you're just hearing the words and just saying them out, but you're saying them with good diction and you're saying them in a way that, that the computer is going to understand it the most, most effectively. And it, it's, it's a really effective way to do streaming, to do that. And the training time is much lower than the stenographer training, which is, and so there, and this was made most popular, I, I believe in Australia because they have really high requirements for what needs to be captioned. And so they had to find a better way, a faster way to, to build up their, their workforce. Yeah, and I participated in a sub-sub niche of that, which is using ear prompter on some sort of live set to listen to the dialogue that needs to be spoken and to translate that in as close to real time as you can so that you are performing somebody else's content. I used it in circumstances where the legalese of the script had to be precise. Every word had to be exactly as written because it had been vetted by a lot of people. So, yeah, there's just all sorts of things happening out there in this space that I find fascinating. Let's move on to the next question. From Roscoe Jones in, oh, excuse me, from Douglas Carmichael. Uh, he says, Alex, you mentioned running LumaFusion on a laptop. Would this be an M series MacBook Pro? Alex? If I said that, it was by mistake. Uh, it, I, I've only used LumaFusion on an iPad. There you go. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Now we go to Roscoe Jones in uh, Madison, Indiana. He says, will AI dominate the moving image, both documentary and narrative styles, or just fancier montage sequences? And he has a link there um, for Academy Award competition editing. Et cetera. <laughs> yeah, John Preto, give us a hint. So I've been playing with DI, DID. We have, uh, we have the office hour in, inside the AI office hour labs. We have uh, Ada. And so I, I've taken Ada Lovelace, and then we've animated her with DID, and then the other one that people are using right now is Runway. I don't. I wouldn't say dominate. I think that's years away, but I see lots of people taking mid-journey images and then doing tweening with that. You can feed those into Runway ML and then set up an animation. They don't look great, but they're they're getting there. And then there's a ton of text to video on 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 the way. Is DID an acronym, or I'm not used to that. D-ID.com website. Oh, D-ID. So it's a, a vendor. Excellent. Courtney? Yeah, for the, the demonstrations that I've seen on creating video from AI have not been great. They're more surrealistic than naturalistic. So uh, for creating narrative styles or documentary stuff, I it's going to be a long way away. So right now, it looks kind of like a you know, Salvador Dali painting that's evolving from frame to frame as it moves, because there's not a lot of consistency when AI is redrawing it from frame to frame. Uh, so, but it is coming. They have been coming out with uh, 3D generation just now for AI stuff. Uh, for Mid Journey, I think, has been working on uh, generating 3D models. So I think it's not too far away from generating. Uh, you know, 3D images that move at 24 frames per second and consistency between the frames. So you don't have it going from two fingers to four fingers to six fingers to three fingers to two as you go from <laughs> frame to frame. Hmm. Hard to buy gloves. Alex, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that we're going to see more and more of it. I think that there, there are definitely interesting places. And, and again, we have to always remember that this is where Dolly was three or four years ago is where video is right now. And so we should expect this to get much, much better. Um, I think that Runway does a pretty good job of doing motion capture. So you can have a person doing something and then you can have a CG character doing that thing. And it's doing a pretty good job at, at, at gathering those things up. Also, if you've seen any of the Wes Anderson stuff, it's kind of funny. People keep, there's somebody doing trailers as Star Wars, if it was shot with Wes Anderson and The Matrix, if it was shot with Wes Anderson, and they're obviously using Mid Journey or something like it. And then what they do is they put it onto some AI that just adds a little bit of facial motion um, to the to the stills that are being created. And it's, it's kind of funny. And so I, I think that is it going to replace feature film, A-level feature film work? 
probably not tomorrow, but is it going to be funny things that we add to YouTube for, you know, and, and things that we start to add into it? Uh, I think that's already happening. And I think you're going to see that continue to grow. And, and the real problem for Hollywood is not a lot of these technologies replacing them. That's not the, that's not the real issue. It's, it's whether these technologies will replace the time that was spent watching those features. Um, as things are entertaining and there's lots of it coming out and it starts to get reasonably good and, and almost anybody can do it, will they want to watch as much TV, as much of the streaming, as much as feature films as they did in the past? And that fragmentation that's already really impacted the market can get worse and worse and worse because people just have other things to do that are just as interesting to them as going to the movies. And the other thing that I was struck by, because I think I saw that, I didn't read the Scientific American article that's referenced here, but I did see one of the first, hey, AI just won a photography competition, and the image was really pretty. It was really nice. And I immediately thought, well, the expectation in photography contest judging is still not that AI might be involved it is going to flip and now people are now that people understand that this ai technology can create imagery eventually there will be some i assume some way to try to vet whether or not this image could have been generative or was actually captured in the traditions of photography it it's a it's a moving target and there's a lot of work and a lot of talk and a lot of chat and a lot of regulation potentially that's coming into this as everybody talks about where are we in a world where things can be generated that looks so real it's hard to tell the difference between the old style and the new. Alex, you have more thoughts on it? Yeah, one of the problems there, though, is that now they're even getting past. First, they were worried about the photography, but now they're doing competitions that are building up that are prompt competitions. And so they're not trying to, they're, they are um, promptographers. <laughs> you know, and so, promptography, uh, that's great. <laughs> someone someone told me that word, and I was like, oh, yeah, prompt. Promptographer um, is, uh, is, you know, taking these images. And so people are now challenging people on Twitter to, like, do your best to do this. This is the kind of thing we're challenging you to do. And then people put up their images. Um, and then you're seeing more and more of those types of things um, starting to come out. And I think we're going to see more competitions where you're given a very limited amount of time. Like you have to produce this thing. And then people are are given a very short amount of time to go prompt something and then post it, the, the best image that they have. And I think that that's probably what's coming is not really trying to fake it and make it like photography, but give it its own space. And I know that a lot of those technology bigwigs who are heavy into AI have been testifying a good little bit and trying to figure out where to put guardrails on some of this so that there is a separation between things that are generated and things that are captured from reality so that at least we can start to get some kind of lines about, hey, this picture of that politician with that, in that situation that is very unflattering was generated not organic to what the politician actually did. That's just my presumption over time. You've got a lot of, There's, we got a lot of tough stings to go through here. Go ahead, Alex. We're not going to be able to tell. Like, yeah. like, like, we just have to give that up. We have to give up the fact that we're going to be able to tell. And we have to know that we just can't, shouldn't trust any single image or any single video that we see in the internet. And we shouldn't, we should have stopped doing that about 30 years ago. Um, but we're, but now it's gotten much more intense that you just can't trust what you see. And it's not going to get better. Like it's not, it's it's only going to get harder and harder and harder uh, to figure that out. And so, how it's used in evidence, how it's used in those other things, are are not going to be um, obvious. And so, so I think that it, you know, we this is why it's so important to have multiple inputs of information. But a single point of information will be worthless inside of five years. And so there you have the era of the generative politician. That's pretty scary. <laughs> Let's move on before we get too deep in the weeds here. Next question. Okay, from um, Paul Buchan in Columbus, Ohio. He says, with an AWS Elemental Link, uh, can audio be remapped in media live? I'm just looking to move channels three and four to one and two, and he's struggling to make it work. Alex, you have a solution for Paul? Yeah, you definitely can do that in media live. So you have the link, and the link will support up to 18 channels. The UHD link will support up to 16 channels, and they'll pass those all in. What we use them for mostly is to pair them up so that we can um, send them out as different interpretations. So we we have interpreters, they're all p piping audio in, we're putting all those tracks up, and then we split them out into multiple streams using the same source and grabbing different ones. The thing to remember is, is that they work in pairs. So they're, they're, you know, they're, you have to set up those pairs 
inside of uh, media. It's hard to do without, I don't, I'm not in it right now inside of the AWS, but you have to think about them in pairs and it will not, you know, and it's just a matter of moving one pair up and the other pair down. And um, we'll try to, I'll try to, if you ask that again, I'll try to set up a, a demo of that, but I don't, I just, it's just hard to come up with uh, uh, on the, on this hour, but maybe a lab might be good as far as, uh, what we ought to do is probably, I'll put it back there, put it into a suggestion is basic link operation inside of AWS is probably a great second hour. So put that in our second hour suggestions and we'll find a, a Friday that we can put it into. Our fabulous back end crew, I'm sure, are writing notes at the moment. Let's go to the next question. From uh, Douglas Carmichael, he says, with SRT output in Zoom ISO 2.1, where would you see that feature used? Alex? I think the biggest feature, the biggest way that that's going to end up being used is most likely going to be de dealing with delivering Zoom footage uh, to things in the cloud. So if you're if you're in the cloud and you want to deliver an SRT to vMix or to other things, I think that that's going to be the primary use of that, I think. Um, but of course, there's also SRT to SDI conversion boxes. We were just looking at some in, in, internally. Um, so you can be sending that out to a lot of different things, but getting it into AWS for production, uh, whether it's transport or getting it um, to another video within a within that system, um, I think is probably where, you know, going from location to location, not so much I mean, NDI is very useful in certain areas there, but I think that SRT is going to be uh, a very rel reliable as it as it's set up to, um, to to move that move that around. Secure, reliable transport. There you go. It's in the name. Let's go to the next question. Next question comes in from uh, Sean Johnson. He says, "Is there a way for New York? Is there a way to configure a Stream Deck control basic functions?" primarily mic mute and unmute in Zoom running on a separate computer than the one Stream Deck is connected to, but on the same network. Same scenario for OBS mute and unmute. Samuel Nordvik, got a suggestion here? Yeah, that's exactly what I use. I run Zoom on my Mac and I have my uh, Stream Decks connected to my PC and I use a small program called Vicro Listener that's integrated into a companion. So there's a companion plugin here. And what I do, I just put up the modifiers, shift and F12. And then I have to run the listener program on my, on my Mac. I think and I just saw that. the same for OBS. Vicrio listener, V-I-C-R-E-O. I think Vicrio listener, for those of you who might be looking. Alex? Yeah, that sounds great. I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with that one. Another way to do that would be some, something like Companion. So Companion could go talk from one place to another and then uh, activate it. All right. Oh, Samuel, you wanted to get back in on that before we move? Yeah, it's, I'm using Companion with Victor Listener. Okay. Oh, perfect. That's great. Nice. Excellent. All right, let's go to the next question. Next one comes in from Austin, Texas, and Paul Wallace. He says, what do you do to hot rod your microphone? And are you satisfied with it and the accoutrement that you have with it? Courtney, start us off here. Well, I put some uh, flame decals on the side of it. To not run my, <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't really do anything. It uh, my tech zone uh, came with this lovely carrying case uh, to transport it, and it uh, comes with. <laughs> Be careful! A, a finger snapper. <laughs> it comes with a finger breaker. And it comes with a shock mount and the microphone and uh, and a little uh, leather pouch for it. So uh, our, our, our windscreen, I'm not sure if it came with that leather pouch because I've got a different microphone in there now. But uh, a good shock mount is one thing you need and uh, uh, a good cable, XLR cable to go out. And, and my microphone is happy. I don't use any uh, of the Aphex since I have a Rodecaster Bro here. Uh, it has all those Aphex uh, uh, goo gaws and extras to uh, change the compression, the dynamics, and uh, uh, the um, vocal stressor and uh, all those. I don't use any of those. I have all of those turned off. So this is the raw naked microphone you're hearing here. Yeah, it's it's been interesting for me. So for years, I had... I would deliver to my commercial clients two versions, a raw file, which was just me into the microphone, nothing else, and then a broadcast mix, which usually had 
at least mild compression, uh, maybe some de-essing, things like that, depending on the script and what it was going in there. So I would send out two different versions. After working with Alex here in office hours in the early days, I, I took off more and more and more of any processing to the point where I got back to, you're hearing me into the microphone. It's going through with absolutely no effects at all and straight out to Zoom. And I've come to really enjoy this this sound. And I think Alex was right about the fact that the less affected a vocal track is, the easier it is to listen to for a long period of time. Now, that said, I've been working, uh, just having all sorts of fun doing audiobook work lately. There is a very specific set of sound requirements when you're working in that field. And surprisingly, it takes a significant amount of processing to get there. They have very narrow target zones that you have to reach in terms of RMS and levels and um, the, the delta between the highest and the lowest sounds and peak limiting and things like that. So when I finish a raw recording, I have probably five or six passes that I have to put that audio through. Once I do, I can be sure it'll be accepted by quality control at the large audiobooks houses. But without that, it generally won't. And it gets tossed back to me a lot. So it's less that you have to have a ton of processing, but they really are demanding about the, the waveforms that they will receive. And I think that's because they want every piece that they're sending out. And they do hundreds of millions of audiobooks uh, they want them all to be consistent so that when you play one of them off their site and their services, that they all sound not one. One isn't very low and one isn't very high. They're all right there in the middle of that zone. So it's been interesting. No processing here every day, quite a bit of processing over there, but all in service to making their targets work for me. Alex, you had some thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, whether it's video or audio, one of the things that I, I just want, I always want to keep coming back to is the importance of it feeling authentic, you know, that you really feel like you're just talking to that person. And that's one of the reasons that we try to keep away from virtual backgrounds. It's one of the reasons that we try to, you know, those are the kind of things that we try to avoid as much as we can. The biggest thing that we use is, is a noise reduction, which I'm using today. <laughs> so, so the, but those are the things that, uh, that we focus on. Um, but outside of that, we really just try to have a clean image and a clean and clean audio. Yeah, I'm going to support that. In fact, a lot of the the tools that I'm using in the audiobook side are things like Depop and Deplosive and things like that. You can very easily control that individually when you're doing a 30 or 60 second spot. But if you're turning in a 14 hour book read to go through and try to eliminate all the mouth clicks and pops without some kind of automated process is just crazy. I mean, that's just too much content. So you need automation and you need to run it through these processes to make sure that it comes out on the other end as right as you can make it. So interesting. Moving on to the next question. From Steve Yeroff in Madison, Wisconsin. He says, I have JBL 104 speakers attached to a Mac mini via headphone jack. When the audio is first used after wake from sleep, the speakers often take 10 plus seconds to produce audio. Design choice or flawed hard hardware? Courtney, what are your thoughts? Well, OSHA, I think, uh, had a law or a mandate uh, years ago that said any personal equipment that has a headphone jack has to have some type of a limiter to limit the amount of audio that comes out of that headphone jack. And some manufacturers put into place uh, a thing so that when you switched to those, enabled those headphone jacks or turned it on or, wake, or awakened it, uh, if there was audio playing uh, when it went to sleep or something, it wouldn't come out at 100% volume. It would slowly ramp up to avoid you. You know, if you've ever seen anybody switch an audio input to, while well, people are listening on headphones to, you know, 120 dB white noise or something, you see people grab the headphones and throw them across the room, you'll know why. Because it can cause temporary deafness or even permanent deafness if you deliver a high amount of audio signal to headphones. So, if the Mac thinks it's plugged into headphones instead of speakers, that may be what's going on there. It's automatically ramping it up slowly to avoid deafening anybody who's listening on who might be listening on headphones. And this just might be me, but I've noticed there's changes always coming down the pipe with um, when 
I do system updates or things like that, suddenly I will lose a little feature. Like the one that's been, it's not plaguing me, it's actually very trivial, but it used to be that every time I launched into the mode to do the show, my Universal Audio Apollo Solo would be connected directly to the Zoom chain. Now I find I have to go to their driver and just launch it and click on it before it sees that piece of outboard equipment. I don't know why that change has taken place, but it has. So the way that audio and video signals are routed, um, that has been moving a moving target for me lately. Uh, little changes, not anything onerous, but I have to do three or four little things differently every morning when I start up for the show that I didn't have to do before. Courtney, you had one uh, another thought? Yeah, I was, you, you said something that brought something up to me uh, that uh, thought back to me is that, you know, these days, since you're waking up this Mac from a sleep, uh, a lot of times when computers uh, wake up, or they will have to rescan their ports to see what's connected now, since you may have connected something else while it was sleeping. Uh, so it it has to go through that port connection check, and a lot of computers these days, probably the MacBook Pros do too, uh, check their audio outputs to see if it's connected to speakers, headphone, headphone and microphone combo. So it has to run through that self-test on all those inputs. So maybe that's what's taking 10 seconds after you wake it up. Yeah, and you just triggered something to me. It's interesting. Now, if I put both external monitors on, my machine will boot into the mode ready for the show. If I don't put both of those outputs on, the computer will not. It boots into another mode that I use with clients where instead of uh, splitting the output into the... I want the main monitor on to the monitor. I want to uh, mirror my desktop to that monitor, which is something I use with clients all the time. The computer understands whether that second input is plugged in and <laughs> changes accordingly. So it's building more intelligence into what it sees. And it says, oh, Bill's got that second monitor. He must want this. And it's providing me something different. That's really very useful for me because it makes it really easy to boot up into the right circumstance, depending on how I've configured my ports. But boy, uh, I used to have to do that all physically. And I have to spend, I used to have to spend 30 seconds, 45 seconds changing all of my monitor arrays to get ready for the show. Uh, we do have, we have a few more questions here. If you want to sneak another one or two in there, we probably have room for that. If not, remember, your votes are critical, mission critical to uh, what we get to first. And we're getting close to the top of the hour and our special guest. So just be aware, vote, vote often and vote. And that's what we'll t look at first. Let's go on to the next question. Coming in from uh, Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. He says, can you use a ham radio microphone with a computer? And can you use a computer or audio microphone with a ham radio? Courtney, are you a ham? I am a ham and Paul is too, so you should know the answer to this. But the problem is with ham radio, uh, since you're operating a transceiver, uh, most microphones designed to work with ham radio have push to talk switches in them, which uh, not only unmute the microphone, but they also do a contact change so that the transmitter can sense that you've pressed it and can switch from receive to transmit. Uh, so uh, you probably don't want to use one of those on your computer unless you rewire it and take only the microphone signal coming out of it. Most of them are dynamic microphones. Um, so bear that in mind. And uh, you would, and usually most ham microphones either terminate in a tippering ring sleeve quarter inch phone jack or a four pin amphenol microphone type connector that's four pins and a screw lock type uh, connector on it so it, it you would have to rewire it anyway probably uh, to work so i just buy another microphone <laughs> <laughs> let's move on to the next question next one comes in from uh, henry ramos in yonkers new york he says anyone mount a stream deck xl uh to a tripod leg and how'd you do it alex yeah, you probably want to look at Etsy. <laughs> so there's a lot of people uh, that are building things like this and doing 3D prints of a variety of different ways of mounting under tables, on tables, uh, quarter 20s wrapped in. There's all these different ones. So do a search. If you just Google mounts on those, you'll see them. But Etsy is kind of the place that a lot of people are, are, are doing those. If you have a 3D printer, you may also want to look at Thingiverse. So Thingiverse is going to have um, and Sketch Lab, both of those are going to have people throwing 3D models up of things that they've already done. 
and making it available to anyone that has a 3D printer. So those are the two places I would go. A lot of the Etsy stuff looks like it was stuff that came from Thingiverse and someone took it and printed it and sold it. And they're not very expensive and it, uh, they, they, they look like they work pretty well. I haven't had to actually do it, but, um, but that, that looks like a pretty good solution. Courtney? Yeah, you can just get one of these magic clamps that you can get for clamping the magic arms onto things and clamp it onto the tripod and on the end of it. If you don't have a quarter 20 on the stream deck, um, uh, you you can take something like this is 3D printed, but something that's used to mount a monitor uh, or something like that, uh, that has a flat surface on it. You use the command scripts from uh, 3M and they make a nice uh, removable back that you can put on the back of the stream deck and they'll hold it pretty securely. Yeah, I use command strips all the time. The cool thing about them is that they hold pretty firm, but at the end of the use, if you want to take that uh, receiving Velcro type stuff off, you can just pull a little tab on them. They come off really clean. Uh, and the other thing for me is traditional grip gear has a lot of stuff like this. I usually mount things like that to my tripod leaps using a Mafer clamp, some kind of a short magic arm or uh, friction arm. And then there are all sorts of little mounting plates you can get, some with straps, some without, some that you can do, uh, like Courtney was suggesting, use command strips or Velcro or something like that. You can usually, going into the great world of grip gear, find something to mount anything to anything pretty robustly because people have been solving these problems for many years. Courtney, had a last quick thought? Uh, yes, don't be too robust because if you're clamping onto a tripod leg, you can dent it, or if it's carbon fiber, you can crack it. And uh, once you crack that carbon fiber, it's bad news. So don't over tighten if you're putting a clamp on. And I suggest putting a piece of cloth or something around the tripod leg before you tighten it down and don't over tighten. Yeah, I'm going to double down on that because I've crushed legs too. I have actually almost always have tripods in the classes that I use that are both carbon fiber and aluminum tube for specifically that reason. If I'm going to clamp, I go with the aluminum tool tube. And if I'm going to use the carbon fiber, I'm hoping that the tripod manufacturer was smart enough to give me a either a quarter 20 or a 3 8 16 up near the head where I can screw something into it and not compromise those legs. Let's go to the next question. This comes in from Gordon Lake in Los Angeles. He says, a 3,600-watt EcoFlow battery can power my gear for a one-hour show. Is that a better backup than a quiet Honda generator that is less flexible in where you can place it? Alex? A lot of these batteries have gotten great. <laughs> so um, having, I would tend to say both. Uh, the, the Honda 2000, which is probably the one you're talking about, is a very quiet one, but you can't run it inside. Or you, you can run it inside. You shouldn't run it inside. <laughs> so, so, so that's, I think there's a carbon monoxide issue there's there, carbon right? carbon monoxide, there's fire, there's no noise. There's a whole bunch of reasons not to run your Honda 2000 in, inside of a building or inside of a truck or inside of anything. You know, it needs to be outside. So it doesn't make a lot of noise and you don't think it will be a problem, but it, it will kill you. So anyway, so the, um, uh, and, and so um, keep that outside. Um, but it, those little generators do a great job and they will produce enough to run most of our smaller kits. And we've definitely used one or two of them uh, in production. So they're, they're great little generators. Um, the, but you having a battery backup that can take, do the whole show is amazing. So I don't know if it'd be one or the other. If I, if I had access to the outside and I didn't have access to power, shore power for whatever reason, I would be tempted to have a generator that then ties into the, that's powering the power bank power bank takes over if the generator like a ups you have another place to do power and probably, probably put a ups in between to switch between the two i i you know be very very careful about that power obviously is very important to your show so so the, i would think through those things as i as i built that out for a smaller kit um i wouldn't lean on a battery the more you lean on that battery the less it'll work so so as you start to use it over and over and over again you're gonna that that it powers one hour becomes less over time Let's go to the next question. Next one comes in from Douglas Carmichael. And he says, I've been looking at a merging technologies Anubis audio interface. Can Dante devices in AES 67 mode work for adding to it? Or should I use a MADI Ravina converter? And he has a Alex is going to help us out here. I would use a MADI Ravina converter. I wouldn't try to do, I wouldn't try to get special. You, with Especially with interfaces and audio interfaces, get a product, get a tool that will do the thing that it needs, it's designed to do and don't get creative <laughs> like with these because uh, especially when you're moving from digital to digital, you're going to have, number one is I don't think this will be compatible at all 
But even if it was, uh, I wouldn't try to do it because you're now dealing with clocking and all kinds of other things. Just get a box that makes the conversion that needs to be made um, and that, that will read the one thing that you need and output the other thing that you need. Let's go to the next question. Next one comes in from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. It says, how do special needs folks handle volume controls and mic and speaker selection on their computers? Harshid's going to start us off here. So for PC, I go to the run dialog or the start menu and type in mm. SYS.CPL. That opens up our mixer. So if I do need to alter with my <clears throat> interface or anything like that, I could check there. Um, other than that, I tend to route my audio to, um, let's say, my interface. So in this case, even my uh, screen reader audio, uh, I, I set it up where the sound card is changed to the SSL2. And then if I input anything else, I ensure that the sound is routed from the SSL2 specifically because that's what I'm using as my sound source. Um, I try to avoid using uh, Windows or anything else to uh, alter the sound because sometimes it's unreliable, but um, you could always type in mixer in your start menu. And if you needed to, let's say, adjust your screen reader volume versus uh, a YouTube video or something like that, uh, you could always go ahead and do that that way. And then as far as Mac is concerned, <clears throat> There are uh, plenty of different ways people uh, try to alter uh, the way that they use their volume controls. And again, the principle is trying to have control on what audio is coming in or going out. So with the uh, Max, you have voiceover and it's part of the system. So the volume and all the control is coming out of one pipeline. Um, and to control it indifferently, uh, you know, people have used applications like Loopback and such that way that they have more control, granular control over it. So if that could be an option too, to use applications to control it. But um, I use basically my screen reader and then my SSL2 interface. Excellent, thank you. Let's go to the next question. This one comes in from a fellow named Alex Lindsay in Novato, California. He says, where is Alex? Are you impersonating <laughs> well, Carmen San Diego yeah, for us? Yeah, exactly. Where is Alex? <laughs> I just thought I'd, I'd share, you know, so um, I'm coming in. Uh, there was a couple of people that was they were asking where I was going to come in from. So I'm coming in from uh, a building in Washington, D.C. Um, that is, this is uh, I'm DCI, D Distributed Communications, and so, or, uh, and so uh, Diversified Communications. And so Diversified here, this is an insert studio. I'm not using it as an insert studio. Typically, there's a camera here with a teleprompter and a thing. But this is probably the most connected building in, in most of the country. There's probably three or four buildings like this. All of Eurovision is uh, that comes into the United States is about um, 100 feet from here. The switch is about 30 feet from here. Uh, there's Vivix, AVOC. Um, so I, I wanted to find a good connection for our show because I definitely didn't want I wanted to make sure I was here for this conversation for the second hour. And so um, so we I talk, I used to have an office here, a production studio here. So so anyway, so that's that's where I a couple people were asking were texting me and asking where where I actually was. So I figured I would acknowledge it on the show that I'm I'm not in my in my house. I'm here in DC for some other things and and I needed to find a good place. And this is about the best place in the in the in the in Washington, DC area to be in. Anyway, so you were saying that that's one of the most connected facilities on the face of the earth. Is that probably, what kind yeah, of... there's not that many. There's some that are better connected, but not, not many. There's 26 dishes on the roof. Uh, and again, almost every piece, every type of fiber that you could have coming in here, there's direct fiber links to BT Tower. There's uh, and the White House and the Hill and SCOTUS. And, you know, there's microwave that covers about half the city. So it's, it's a pretty, uh, pretty connected building. So if you go off the air, we should all just run. You should run. My <laughs> if, I lose, if I lose connectivity, there's something very bad just happened, and and there, there's probably going to be a lot of news. You want you you don't need to watch our show. Okay. Uh, well, that all said, we are very very close to the top of the hour now, and so we're going to turn uh, to our special guests. And I've asked Alex to to kind of take over from this and host the rest of things. So, Alex, do you want to introduce our special guests today? Yeah, we're really excited to have Michael Drazen and uh, Jim Toten here um, to talk about HDR. As you know, we're slowly moving um, office hours to HDR, um, and it's it's a process, you know, of figuring out oh these devices work here and this works here and this is how you know and figuring all of those bits and pieces out has been a bit of a research project as well as a partnership with a lot of hardware developers to kind of get that all working. But as we started to dig into this, I really wanted to bring uh, true experts who have really been thinking hard about this for quite a long time to come in and, uh, you know, 
share a little bit about what they where, what they have um, figured out so far and uh, and really talk about the pipeline from glass to glass and really where they start on one end and where they end up on the other. And I don't know if, if um, Michael, do you want to kind of kick it off and talk a little bit about the process? Is that me, Michael? Oh, yeah. My, yeah. <laughs> Just making sure there aren't like several other Michaels that you could have been tossing to. Exactly. Exactly. Sorry about that. Yeah. But it, if, it, it, can you give us a little overview of what you've been working on? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd say that uh, for the last probably five to seven years, been working on overall that initiative of, you know, how do we do HDR? And uniquely, it became the thing that really helped define a broadcast. And it's really about what the experience is that you can bring to the audience. So HDR all of a sudden became this defining technology that was like, oh, look, once you see it and you understand its capabilities and the power that it brings from uh, all kinds of perspectives, you, you know, we have technical perspectives that a lot of people like to dig into and we have operational perspectives. And, it's, and when, you, when you really break it down, it comes down to the storytelling and how do you how, how do you better convey the story you're trying to tell to your audience? And I think what's really rung true of a lot of the, you know, from, if I look at this compared to a lot of the technologies and initiatives that I've worked on, this like transcends everything. Like everybody, when you put them in front of an HDR display and they see it in HDR and, you know, it, admittedly, every scene in every scenario is not an HDR scene. And it's not, it's not to be brighter. It's not to do, you know, it's not to make up where something lacks, but the scenes that do really, you know, are suitable for HDR, it just sings and it gives so much new latitude for the creatives and for storytelling that I think the best transformation that we've seen in the last couple of years, it's, it went from a, you know, a technical, you know, objective and things you want to do to production with insisted on it. So our, you know, our producers and, you know, what was that last season for two, you know, national football games uh weekly we're like there there was no option to not do those broca- broadcasts in hdr and that came out of you know both of those gentlemen were involved with olympics they looked at it every day they look you know and it was just like they understood it so i think the biggest success for the initiative is when it stops being a, a technical experiment to productions like the gotta have it yeah no absolutely absolutely and and jim what would you say are the, the biggest challenges as you start to get into hdr when you get an hdr production what, what are the, the the biggest roadblocks of, of making it work i hate to go right into this but it has to do sometimes with the personnel that are working in the trucks um because you're asking them to do extra work and more work than what they're used to doing and they're a lot of them are very comfortable and set in their ways and when you present something new to them, sure, there's a, a few of them, like the technical directors that we work with, that are very excited and go all in. Um, but there are a certain certain people in the craft that are, are hesitant because they built their brand on the way they, for instance, shade cameras. And now we're asking them to shade cameras to slightly different tools. And that gives them in their perceived mind some limitation of what the SDR is going to look like. Um, so it's, it's, there's there's some challenges. Those are the, probably the biggest challenges. So, Jim, would you say that, you know, with respect to the successes we've seen, uh, most often if you go up in the parking lot and try to figure out how to do HDR, it's a big struggle. But if you have broken down your show prior to getting in the parking lot, go through all the elements from graphics to cameras, especially cameras to AR to... That's very true. Yeah, the, 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 the big takeaway is if you've uh, got total control of everything, every camera and transmission, and you're only doing HDR and you, all your archive is HDR and all of your graphics and every element coming in is HDR, it's a very easy, simple thing to do. You just turn HDR on everything and every monitor is HDR and you're happy. But um, especially something like Thursday Night Football, where there are so many moving parts and so many pieces and external vendors that, um, and a lot of people that, that think they know HDR when they really don't. They go, yeah, we can do HDR, we can handle it, but they really can't because they didn't bring the right tools or the right adapter or the right monitoring capability. So yeah, uh, planning, I don't know, uh, I was brought in late to the Thursday night football. Michael, when did you start planning for that? That was how many months, weeks before? Yeah, that was, I mean, it was pre, like they they rolled on brand new trucks. So it was in the truck build that you start to think about like, what the operator position is, what tools he needs, what monitors go where, what, you know, cameras there are. So, you know, kind of where Jim was leading, like the overall success 
of these productions really relies, I think, in our opinion, in the planning for those productions. It's like you can't show up and not know how many feet of cable you need to get to your camera positions. Like you, you, you just extrapolate from that into the HDR space is really just ensuring you have a plan. And prior to your plan, you, you should have a philosophy for how you're going to work. You should know, you know, for example, what LUTs you're going to use, what anchor point you're going to shade to in HDR. Uh, how the conversion process is going to work. Um, like, how have your graphics been produced? Are they progressive? Are they interlaced? Do, do the elements that the TD needs for replay effects, do they need to be converted before they get there? Like, it just what do you do with, uh, you know, you have to handle fills and keys differently, making sure, I guess, you understand every step in the process and that having that understanding then leads to the success because you you're not, you don't get on site and we generally don't get multiple days of science projects on site to figure out what you're doing at this point anymore, just from a cost standpoint. So you really need to have done that research before you get there and have have a philosophy you're gonna work on. And I, I'll say what's been fun, especially with HDR over the last couple of years is that philosophy has evolved. It's been a learning process. We've, we've started one direction, we've gone that way for a bit. We had another partner, a colleague come up with something new and we've kind of all pivoted and gone another direction. So what was that? And what was that pivot? Like, what, what did you start with and, and where did you pivot and what did you end up with? Yeah. So I think the biggest one was like, if we go all the way back, we had vendors pushing to do production in S-Log3, mm -hmm. which is a great format. And S-Log3 has a ton of dynamic range, right? So the idea was you just run the entire project in log. And then at the very end, you do a conversion to whatever, whatever H, uh, HDR curve you want to put on. Yeah. And so, and we tried it and we fired up a show and I want to say we did it out at Pebble Beach. And then we discovered all the other problems. Like, what do you do with graphics? Like it log and is great for working in cinematic and you're, you know, you're going frame by frame and scene by scene and you control the viewing experience, but very much so in broadcast television, you have to think about that entire arc of the show and you don't get to make those scene by scene decisions and you have graphics that have to work from scene to scene and the graphics aren't going to change you can't change the white level so like where do you put the diffuse white and graphics and make it consistent mm -hmm. and we have this other commercial aspect of it's kind of important to roll the uh spots in between our content that paves for what we're doing kind so of, how do you know you do because it's not a very expensive production that you're working on. So, you know, you know, it's, it's not like you need to need the money, you know. Right. Yeah. So it's like and, you, and we saw what happened with the Calm Act and with audio and right. And you couldn't go from, you know, you're, you're sitting watching something and then all of a sudden you go to commercial break and get blown out of your living room. Right. right. So a similar experience with, you know, how do you shade the video and how do you maintain that consistency? over a multi-hour production, which is different than a film production. So getting back to the question, like we started with S-Log3, we tried it. The other problem is S-Log3 in, in a normal SDR monitor is unusable. And so seven years ago, the trucks didn't have HDR displays across the entire mobile unit. Right. So from S-Log, we transitioned to HLG and you know that became a very consistent way to work. And you had, you had really had two camps, you had a camp fully behind HLG and you've had BBC and NHK very invested in HLG and the technology. And I guess the it can be summed up as HLG scales to the capabilities of the display. So if you have a 500 nit display, you can take all that dynamic range and it just scales. If you have a thousand nit display, it scales for a thousand nits. Now, now, what do you, what, what would you, what would, have you ever thought about doing a PQ curve as instead of the HLG curve? Well, so there, so there's the, there's the other camp who are very dead set on PQ and PQ works on an absolute scale. So it says, okay, you have a 500 nit display and artistically they decided that this element should sit at 250 nits. So it will sit at 250 nits and then display the display that will be very consistent if they're following the interpretation of PQ correctly. Um, and then, so if you have something at 800 nits and you only have a 250 nit display, that display won't show it. Where very much like SDR TV today and what we've all become uh, or have been accustomed to is it's dynamic and it changes per display. So if you watch SDR, it's been built traditionally around a hundred nit workflow. If you have most of the displays you buy today, like an OLED, you're not getting a hundred nits out of that display. Like if anybody has a CRT at home still, 
you can get 100 nits. All of our flat panels is like minimum 250 to 300 nits when we're watching SDR. Now, is there any concern over the 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 the, the, the basically the the trajectory of the curve on the HLG? So the HLG is a much flatter curve that goes across that. And is there any concern over when you stretch that to higher, you know, to the 2,000 nits, 4,000 nits? that you end up pulling that curve really, really, uh, you know, there's not enough data, especially in a 10 bit signal to hold that, hold that stretch in the same way that a PQ curve would. So I would say that it's an interesting conversation to have a, how many nits you actually need. I say that very much so the PQ camp says, yeah, you need 10,000 nits. The mm -hmm. HLG camp says you don't. I would say right. in practice, I've said in front of, there's only a few, you know, professional displays that can push a thousand nits edge to edge at you. Mm -hmm. It's exhausting sitting in front of a thousand nit display for four hours, like, and mm -hmm. with a baseball game, it's, you have to be conscientious, like a daytime game, right? Like it's not necessarily about being brighter. Um, right. So, and I think we've come up with a pretty good compromise between the, those two different camps of philosophies between HLG's better or PQ's better where from a production environment, it's really running in HLG and that just works and it flows and we understand how to use it and we it interrupts between all the different vendors. Right. And in the distribution environment, we're making a transition to PQ because that's really become the de facto standard for support, whether it's OTT players, it's uh, TVs or whatever that is. Interestingly, we have been using HLG with uh, an anchor point, you know, based on that thousand nit scale and an anchor point at 75%. Mm -hmm. So we've almost kind of created this hybrid environment where we've kind of fixed the HLG, as I said, to a thousand nits. We know right. where 103 nits are. We've kind of taken the dynamic part out of it and made it more precise because we've said, like, we're going to run on this set scale and this is how it works. Right. which is very much so a traditional PQ workflow. Um, it just, now we're doing that with HLG and that's very much so, so we can, uh, we can establish consistency between our HDR environment and our SDR environment. Right. So that like, for example, when you're shading, you, you need to be able to see both those environments. Now we like to say it's a lot like when, you know, we first transitioned to 16 by nine, we kept everything four by three safe. And then it was like one day, all the graphics just slowed <laughs> out. Like, and enough, okay, like, enough of this. You've had, you've had enough. We, 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 we were nice for a while and now we're done. <laughs> I, I, and I can't even, I, I don't know if somebody else can like, what was that defining moment that was like, all of a sudden everybody's like, I, we woke I, up one day and we weren't, yeah, it was now a full 16 by nine, not four by three safe, but. 16 it's, by nine. It's usually, so, it's, it, you know, because you guys are so close to it, it's usually the Olympics or, or the, or the Super Bowl <laughs> that some graphics team decides we're just not going to do that anymore. And they just do it. And then the whole, within two or three years after that, I, I I've watched that a lot. And it's why one of the, when we, when the Olympics come out or, or, or the Super Bowl, we oftentimes break those graphics down in the show because I feel like they drive, um, you know, they drive a lot of development, even on a basic news show, the the ideas that are used on those largest ones because those have the largest design teams <laughs> you know, and the and they're the, they're, they've thought about it more than almost everybody else and I think that that's part of you know people kind of look at it and go oh okay I'm going to try that now now the and, and HLG of course was was made specifically so that it could be a hybrid right so that it could you you'd be able to play it out and someone who was watching on an SDR set could still see their SDR and the HDR would just look better in an HDR set. Is that, is that correct? I, I would say that it looks, it's good enough to QC. So like we went back to that truck example and we had a whole lot of trucks that had SDR only displays and we were starting to do HDR on those trucks. You could take HLG and pump it into an SDR display. And if you were a replay operator and you just, you weren't looking for the quality of the video, but you needed to see where the players were, what they're doing, what the action is, your graphics operator, you know, a lot of positions in the production that's totally suitable. Right. If you're in video or the EIC position or like program preset, then we made the, the effort to convert those monitors. At this point in time with the truck, the new trucks being built and how everything, you know, how like whether you're using consumer displays or more professional displays in those truck builds, it's kind of hard to buy displays that don't do HDR. 
So all of a sudden, all of the monitor walls are HDR everywhere, but that brings other problems, right? Like, is that HDR, just saying it's HDR, is that a thousand nit display or is that a 500 nit display? And how does that all sit? Because you could have like your, your, uh, your program preset could be thousand nit displays, but the displays around it are only 500 nit displays. So your things will start to look different. And how do you manage that environment? And it looks like um, you got a, you've got an image here, I think, that... Uh, yeah, I've got a slide here that illustrates what happens when you uh, put HDR content into an SDR specifically display. specifically when you say HDR, this HL, is HLG, HLG yes, right? sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you for... Because we basically are 98%. We spend our... Michael and I spend our lives in HLG, so it's mm -hmm. that's first nature for us. But as you can see, the, if you look closely here, um, desaturation and the highlights kind of blown out is kind of what, what you end up with on the uh, on on the uh, HDR and SDR, not blown out, but you see a, it looks like like a lower level, and you don't see much detail in the whites. Right. But that's like Michael said, that's good enough for a replay operator or somebody QCing something or making sure they got the right clip called up in the right. truck where they don't have HDR displays. That's yeah. Do you want the other slide, Jim? This gets even said. more. Fun. Which one you is do. that? The next one. Yeah, Which we need to do. No, go the other way. If you've got a couple slides here, we're happy to have you show us a couple things. Oh, I mean, we we <laughs> have a deck, it. but uh, yeah. I know that we love to have a conversation. So yeah, we'll as, long, as long as we're on this topic here, um, so let's, this, let's, this yeah, is let's, uh, dig through the, let's dig let's dig through the deck a little bit. I think that this is this is great. Oh, this slide is really have, interesting because this is the this is what we get run into yeah. all the time, which is um, uh, SDR content into an HDR display, and. And this is uh, mainly due to metadata mismatching and, and what we've noticed in the trucks and a lot of the manufacturers don't have their um, SDI metadata handling proper, mm -hmm. meaning um, uh, AVS playback machine, a replay machine won't actually uh, code its output as, uh, as HLG. They might now, that they, but the early days they didn't. So we had to trick the monitor. We had to force the monitors into HLG. So if you set a Sony monitor and force it to Rec 20, uh, Rec 2020 uh, HLG and you put SDR into it, the lower bottom half of the slide here will show you what you, what you see. You'll see a, a color space mismatch and blown out gamma curve. And if you think about it, the, that HLG display is looking for a diffuse white point at 75%. It's now getting it at 100% because, right, when we're shading at SDR whites, it's up at 100. Right. And then so it's like it's 25% more energy than it's expecting. Yeah, absolutely. but the only only a couple people in the truck, the video guy and maybe a, an acute uh, replay guy will see this on a monitor and raise his hand and say, hey, something's wrong. Most everybody else that's working in the truck will kind of won't even notice this. We they everybody on this call about it. Yeah, definitely not in the right, right environment. They're not they're working on other things. It's not it's not definitely not doesn't doesn't look like someone poured coffee over it, which is what, what the other curves might <laughs> look like, like log or PQ are going to look a lot more. Uh, dark and you'll definitely know that you're looking right. at the wrong thing. But but when you get an advertiser and looking yeah. at some of the content, like uh, Little Caesar's uh, logo, which is an orange kind of color, yeah. and if that's got a, a Rec 709, Rec 2020 color space mismatch, and you oh. put that on an LED wall behind talent up in the booth, now you start to see a problem with the color. And now you've, you're on a wild goose chase trying to figure out where the, where the the who's got the wrong let somewhere. Right, right, right. And and it's funny because Jim started that goose chase uh, on one of those football shows last fall. Because if you think about it, we're like graphics, I think, in my opinion, are one of the hardest things to handle in the television environment. Mm -hmm. And it's really like you think about graphics are created in RGB space, right? Zero to 255. Television runs in a YCBCR space. You have well, to Michael, convert. Michael, also remember, graphics are usually produced in sRGB, not 709, which are very similar. But the graphics people think that they think it's the same thing. Right. Sorry, go ahead. That, that, no, that's a great point. That's even, see, right, just added to the complications of the graphics environment. And very much so. So say you have home team color blue that you see on camera, and then they create graphics in home team color blue. And they would like home team color blue to be the same blue you see, you know. And if it's off by like one percent, they're calling like, "Hey, what happened to our logo? It, it got ruined." Oh, but then you have those graphics loaded into the EBS spot box, which is like the T-Day replay element, right? Because it goes to whatever that you know, say it's the helmet with their blue, and then you have the Telestrator that has another blue in it, and then you have all these other like 
All of a sudden, and well, like, then you have things like the you know the, the cowboys' uh, pants aren't aren't actually silver. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're, when you see them in, in real life, they're not, they're like green or, or greenish, but they look silver on TV. But then does that, that produces a whole new problem for you because they, because that was built specifically for an SDR pipeline. Well, and, and it goes, what we've kind of uncovered is some of our SDR pipelines, we became a little lax and things just kind of, we expected it to work and they were mm -hmm. close enough because we didn't have the latitude to see it. Right. And now like we're paying more attention we're finding a whole bunch of problems that are, had existed in our pipelines between graphics to video, and we just kind of let them go. But now all of a sudden, it's like we got to fix them, um, and we, you know, we're digging into that and ripping it apart. And then, so then you throw a LUT process in the middle, and you have graphics that have to get converted from SDR to HDR because we're not, we haven't even really crossed that barrier of creating graphics in HDR yet. And what you can do and what you know want to be cognizant of but sticking to our, our our pipeline problem it's like you have to make sure that from creation to glass that you know the the blue you create is the same blue and i think what's really important there is ensuring that it is the same blue because outside of teams say you have a commercial implication with your graphics well you know pick on pick on our brand say coke has sponsored your sky cam and you put in that coke logo that Coke logo needs to be Coke red in every iteration and right. whether it's so starting in graphics to however it gets inserted. And then it's, you know, just tying it to, uh, we kind of cheated and looked at some of the questions that are coming up. So we're, we're, we're just we're weaving them into our answers. So <laughs> you, get, you get that Coke red and you need to ensure that what you create in SDR converts correctly into the HDR space. And then when you're in the HDR space, it co converts back. And so all that conversion is done using LUTs and LUTs to come out of like, you know, LUTs have been around for, I don't know, Jim, a gazillion years in photography workflows. And that LUTs were really the first, you know, foray into television to convert SDR to HDR and HDR to SDR. Right. And then, you know, it was really the BBC started the work on what development and a lot of what happened was all subjective. It was like, what did my eye see versus what did your eye see? And right. one of our colleagues, Chris Seeger, who works in the technology lab at NBC, he and I were standing in front of the display and describing what we saw completely differently. And we kind of came up with the like, we need an objective way to measure color in conversion processes because mm -hmm. the factor of every human being dif being different between the age of our eyes the make like there's all kinds of stuff and we like we went down this rabbit hole of research and then he really led a tremendous amount of development about objective color metrics and how you measure them and they're all like none of the whether it's the LUTs or anything else but they're all available on the github and i think we're ha happy to post the link and you'll yeah, see it great. in the info. Yeah, um, and I know that, you know, I I, uh, I came into this, you know, I, I even though I worked in film, I didn't touch any film. I just did computer graphics, you know, I just did the shiny ships. And um, and the, uh, but when I came into this, I, I was like, I don't trust my eyes. And so I just lean on scopes completely. So to me, I don't have any, I don't look at any monitor and have any belief of anything I'm looking at. I just want to see the RGB parade. I just want to see the vector scope. I just want to see, you know, like I just, I just sit, sit there and look at it because I don't, I don't trust any monitor. I don't trust my own eyes. I don't trust any of those other things. When we do a lot of green screen and when, with the green screen, I'm just like, I just need to see the green at 70%. Like I, I don't need, I don't need to, you know, we don't need any light meters or anything else. Let's go, let's go ahead and jump into some of these questions, make sure we get to them. And, uh, and yeah, well, I'm going to, I'm going to answer one of them since I know what it is. Well, so like, we'll, we'll, we'll get to them. We'll just, we're just going to okay. go right through them from the top to oh, the bottom. Okay, and, then, and then if we have more time, I'd love to start, talk about a couple things, camera shading, graphics, output, you know, like just to, you know, um, uh, uh, hit, make sure we hit those before the end of the hour. But let's go ahead and jump into the first question. Okay. Coming in from uh, Brad Woodall in Boston. He says, can you explain the difference between the BBC LUT and the NBC Universal LUT? Also, what testing was involved before it was released? Yeah, so uh, he kind of tipped me off on leading that he put this question in. So uh, I would say that the 
both lots they're, they're similar but different and there's some philosophy differences between our colleagues in the uk and how they work and it comes with like it also is driven a little bit by their environment and i kind of mentioned it earlier that most of our domestic television has commercial implications in our lots and there's there's a reluctance in their environment to accept that sdr uh, doesn't need to sit at 100 nits and that has to do with where uh, the mid grade point says. So between getting from SDR to HDR, there's a little bit of difference in where the mid grade sits in that conversion. Um, but in general, the NBC LUTs and the BBC LUTs are reasonably close. Where the big difference comes is going between HDR and SDR. And there's two factors here. It's how do you compress the extra two and a half F stops of light that you get in HDR as you go back to SDR. And in that respect, I will say that uh, the curve, if you look at a waveform, looks pretty similar, but the technology in the MBCU LUTs has, uh, it's a few years newer and they're able, to, the, the colors behind it, a gentleman named uh, Nick and Pablo, uh, who are part of Chromarama, they, they were able to employ some newer technology and how they did that. And then the other part was following a philosophy that NBC gave them was that anything inside the 709 color space needed to convert up, staying consistent into the 2020 color space and needed to convert back. Um, and the Chrome Rama team was able to do that. And you'll and that was kind of the philosophy behind the NBC ULUTs. And that, you know, back to that commercial conversation. Coke Red goes up to HDR, comes back to SSDR. The that same color red is consistent. And then uh, between a dynamic range, we did make some decisions as we went from HDR to SDR. And uh, it, it's slightly different if you looked at a waveform and we could, uh, I think we can find the, the scope shot to show you that. But when you look at it on a, you know, 300 nit display or higher in SDR, you can't really see the difference visually. So, and the other part, and we have to be fair to our colleagues at the BBC, they're publicly funded. They have to essentially put in for the money that they get to spend on R&D. And there is a decision-making process by what those R&D funds go to. And unfortunately, the management or however that happens, the decision was made not to continue to invest in LUT creation and to hand that back to the industry. And so very much so the you know, the team at BBC were involved in the creation of the NBCU LUTs. Um, and the NBCU LUTs, we're not going to say, are like, they're publicly available. They're, again, on that GitHub. The whole point is like, they're as good as they can be right now following the philosophy. If they can be better, or, you know, all years will make them better and share them back to the whole community. Uh, so what Jim brought up here over on the left and I, I'm cheating uh, because I know what one of the other questions is, Alex. So it's like, what <laughs> plus patterns do you use? But I know where that's coming up and we'll just, this test pattern that's up right here on this display is called BT2111, right. which has both uh, 2020 color as well as 709 color. And in and Jim, Jim, if you want to show where it is, the 2020 color in the middle and top there and in the bottom left and right is actually 709 converted to HLG in uh yes exactly in both scene referred and display referred, which is a whole other rabbit hole we can talk about um so this one pattern lets you essentially test everything through your stream and you can see that uh we added some little features over on the left where it says NBCU LUT 3 SDR at 100%, and we'll show you where that goes on the right. And so you can see on the left, you know, there's a, a good stair step every 10% all the way up to 109, because, you know, we it's not a 0 to 100, it's a 0 to 109 here in uh, the US and over in Europe, it's 105. And then as this converts on the right hand side, you can see that you have that curve and the knee, and you can see where you compress. You know, so if the, that stair step, the blocks at 109, 190, 80, you can see where those compress and where 75% uh, in HDR converts to about 94% in SDR. 
Um, this is not, this is a, a Sony monitor, so it's not a, uh, it's not a leader scope or tech scope that's as well. Precise. Let, let me uh, let me talk about a little bit what we're actually looking at here. So this is a Sony monitor that has um, in split screen mode, and the left side is in HLG Rec 2020 color space, and the right side is Rec 709 2.4 gamma, and it's the same HDR HLG signal going into both inputs. Um, the input on the right has the NBC LUT loaded into it, which is the NBC HLG to SDR LUT. And so um, the monitor is doing the conversion for you for the right-hand side. The left-hand side is showing the pure HLG coming in. And um, this is a mode that uh, we set up in video shading and QC areas so you can see. And this goes back to what the single, single uh, master pipeline is. And I think we kind of missed, we didn't go deep into that in the beginning, but I'll quickly brief. The idea of the NBC LUTs and the BBC LUTs and HLG is a, a single master pipeline that can take SDR uploaded to HDR, work in HDR, and then the, at the end, you have a master that can play in HDR and be downloaded for SDR simultaneous. And how that's different than PQ, of course, is, you know, at Netflix and everybody else, is, they, they master their content for each deliverable. There's an SDR mastering, there's an HDR mastering, and they're meant to be as a single single distribution not converted. This HLG allows uh, um, to be uh, down converted for SDR, downloaded for SDR. And this is the only way to really confirm that you can see them both simultaneously. So when you've got live video coming in here, you can look and see how your highlights hold and see how things convert. But the one thing that's very interesting, and it's hard to see here, um, yeah, you can't really see from this photo, but the the reds are different. So if you the on the left side, the the Rec 2020 red, which is the bigger bars, convert compared to the 709 converted red, it's a slightly different different red. And then on the right hand side, after the LUT converts to 709, those reds basically become the same. They come melded in because you don't you can't see the Rec 2020 color, so they need to be. Um, squeezed in there. And if I have the, I don't think I have a photo of the vector scope. Michael might have that on a slide to see what the vectors do after the LUT. And that's, that's where you, once you get an, your head wrapped around how that works, then it gets uh, really interesting. But the, um, the real cool part is that the, um, the uploading and the, the, the LUT package. And this other thing that we have trouble with is People like to, to use the term oh, LUT generically. Oh, we put the LUT in. It's LUT and it's okay. It's, we need to be very specific. Are you talking about the SDR to HDR LUT or the HDR to SDR LUT? Because it's very easy in devices like an FS HDR to load the wrong LUT. And that's happened many, many times in these trucks where the engineers are just loading a LUT and they load the wrong LUT. And then you've got a a conversion that looks really, really funky. And it's hard to figure out where that is, especially when that becomes a graphic element that gets um, keyed over something else in, downstream and that, that composite goes somewhere else. And now you've got a, a, a mismatch of LUTs already composited. How do you fix that? And that's... Uh, and I think that's a good point. That's like, as you set up to do your production or your show, you really need to take the time to put test patterns through all the paths, make sure that all the conversions set up correctly. Like it's the same thing that we fax all the audio channels, right? As you build different, you know, swaps and stuff that you're going to do in the router, you go and make sure you got it all right because us humans make mistakes. And where you give us an opportunity to mis make a mistake, we will then find another opportunity to make another mistake. So. That's why we test things. Um, and so here's, here's what I just just like just like an audio, you want to listen to a down mix mono on a little orotone just to make sure there's no phase problem somewhere else. You will kind of do that with looking at the download to make sure because it's very easy to create a a crime in HDR that looks okay on an HDR monitor, but when it gets downloaded to SDR, you've got problems with skin tones or you got problems with black levels. You got a, a number of things. And so this, what we're showing on screen is actually on the PDF that's in that GitHub that, you know, this is what it should look like in your conversion from HDR to SDR and what you should see on the scopes. And this, you know, we just scope uh, the monitor that Jim had a picture of was uh, a Sony X series, which we really like because you don't need another device to load LUTs in and you can do that side by side on them and has scopes built in. I mean, 
but this is this is a shot probably from one of our leaders and like you can see that a uh, little bit more detail a lot more functionality between you know you have the waveform you have the picture you have the vector you have a cie diagram the cie is very hard to see in this but um you it it does help visualize you know as jim was saying that that red that you have in hdr where does that red go when you get to sdr and the consistency there that's great i'm okay, still on answering that question alex do you want to yeah, well, yeah, we'll, we may we'll have go, answered we'll, more than one question, which you might have. So we'll we'll just if we say you already answered it, we'll just keep going. But we'll just rack through these. We've got a bunch of them lined up here. So um, yeah, Courtney, you were going to ask, you were going to add something. I was just going to. Uh, it's it might be open up a whole nother can of worms, maybe I'll wait. But I was just going to ask about when you have a monitor that's part of the set, where do you apply the LUT, you know, and the, and that monitor may be at a fifty six hundred white point, or it may be a nine thousand white point. And you're photographing it with a camera that doesn't react the same as your eyes. Where's the LUT applied in the monitor yeah. itself, in the pipeline? You uniquely have the best guy to talk about that, right? I have a really good example of it. I got to find this photo. So, um, gosh, so we had we had that problem in the booth, and we had that problem on uh, some special set that we did on Thursday night. But the um, you have that on the short like answer is most of the L the LED displays the uh, onset monitors do not display most of them do not have the ability to do HLG HDR properly huh. and a lot of that has to do because those are those are uh, third party vendors that have been hired to bring their display and mm -hmm. half of them don't have the right software they don't know how to do it so we need to whatever content goes on those onset monitors typically get downloaded to SDR and then they are shot with an hdr camera and if you adhere to the rules of keeping your whites at 75 ire and things like that um it just works what about the difference in white point of the camera the camera is set at 4700 kelvin you know if they're oh that's with oh, well, that, that has nothing to do with hdr that that's basic color color correction color. for onset monitors and that's okay. that's always a problem and that's um you know it's up to the video shader to uh to kind of deal with that because it has to do with lighting and so um, I know that, range, just the color, the white. Point. Right. And I know that uh, in like in the uh, football games up in the booth, they've got control. The lighting director's got control of color temperature of the lights up there. So they're finessing that. And sometimes if they're not communicating with the video shader, they'll fight each other. And the video shader has controls on the um, white balance of, of the feed that's going up to the onset monitor. And in the case of Thursday night and Sunday night, where they've got picture in a picture within the back onset monitor, where the video guy's got two sets of color character controls. He's controlling the color collector, the live video that goes into the window graphic. It comes back down and goes back to the switcher. It goes back up and becomes the entire graphic. And that's how we're, you know, you got a logo like a, a Little Caesars logo in there. It's really hard to figure out which handle controls which part of the orange. Right. It's interesting. They start uh, fighting with each other. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I got um, it. Uh, next question. Next one comes in from uh, Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina. You may have touched on this already. What test patterns and scopes do you use to ensure HDR is correctly passing through your pipeline? Yeah, so uh, we touched on it. BT2111 is the one that's available for free. I want to say that the tips are even on that GitHub last time I looked. Um, in part of that objective color testing we talked about before, we worked with the team at Sarnoff and actually built some different patterns. Um, and that's, you know, we we love this topic. You know, I know we only have a couple minutes left, but if this is, you know, there's more stuff that this audience wants to get into, and like we could we could invite our colleague, you know, Chris Seeger, who had did all that color objective color measurement stuff. And if that's something the audience is interested in, he can go through like how it works. I mean, I yeah. can give you the high level of like big picture, but like he yeah. can get into the nitty gritty of like how you, like he built a system where you can use Voya and you can take, you know, it's like 500 points in an HDR in the signal and you can measure it and then how he plots it. Um, so that there's some other patterns available, but be another, so, another hour that we spend somewhere in the near future. We'd love to have him on. Absolutely. If you, yeah. If you, you're going to have to put some, he could talk for way more than an hour. He's brilliant. He's, 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 he's one of the best colleagues. And I think, you know, I guess on that topic, like if we wanted to break into some other stuff, like you did where Jim was just talking about the various things like AR, VR and how you 
one of the coolest things we've seen working in HDR is that latitude, but it also changes. And what where Jim just mentioned is like, you know, you have your lighting department, you have your video department, and you got to get those guys working together with the AR department. So that, that's that triangle, right? Because any something that video does will affect the other guys. Something lighting does affects yeah. the other guys. So we found some like fantastic success. And it was like, they used to never really talk to each other. But then like, uh, yeah, so like this, like all three of these, they had to talk to each other. They had to get the look that they're looking for. Um, one of the other things like, uh, I believe Jim was with us in Tokyo and we did, we had Mike Tirico out at the Hilton and the, he's, that's an outdoor set with, you know, a whole bunch of ARs. He walked around and Mike Sheehan, our director, like he doesn't, he doesn't like AR as gamey AR. He wants it to fit in the scene and make it feel natural. Right. And a lot of that was like, and I'm going to pick on Bo because he just asked the last question, Bo and Terry and his team at Ross did all that AR, but they did stuff with like track where the sun was so that the glints off the different elements were correct. Right. But, and Bo and Terry and that team were working with the uh, Frank who was shading the cameras and they were communicating and talking to each other so that, you know, Frank wasn't trying to bring down a glint that they were bringing in and that, yeah. By these guys working cohesively together, they, you know, obviously, and lighting was involved in that too. It was like they created this scene. And I don't know, you know, I probably can't pull it up fast enough, but like, well, Rico would wander around on this deck and interact with the graphics in AR space. And it just felt so natural. Yeah. And that was what was so cool about it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, we would love to have you you guys on. We'll break. We'll take all those subjects and just break them out. And and as often as you're willing to come on, I know that you know your time is is uh, is oftentimes stretched out in a lot of ways. But as often as you're willing to come on, we'll have you come on because you know what we're looking at doing in the same way is taking this little show that we're working on and we're slowly moving it to HDR uh, five point one, um, and then eventually Vision and Atmos. And and the the main reason we want to do that it sounds crazy to do a Zoom show and then go to that, but it means to your point that all of our graphics and playback can be in in a, sur a surround format as well as HDR, and we're doing it every day. So the idea is that we have a whole bunch of people that just get used to, at first it's hard to figure out like how do we get all these pieces of equipment in together, and then after that it just becomes like everybody knows how to do that and we don't think about it because it's just part of the pipeline, you know. Yeah, and um, we're, we're super happy to collaborate with you guys and figure out, you know, we'll spend a little time and we'll also help introduce you to our colleagues, like whether yeah. it's our colleagues at Dolby or, you know, Chris or, Absolutely. We'll, we'll, you know, I think that the best part of the whole HDR technology has been like getting to work with everybody yeah. and seeing like, we all know in our community, we all like, we let the business people and some of the production people really compete with each other. But once you have the rights and whether, whether you're doing news, right. And you're in the dirt somewhere and you need a, an adapter that some other station has, like the engineers always help out each other. Right. So this, it, yeah. we, we look at this as, you know, this is our opportunity to like take the information and the experience that we've gained. And we really don't want people to go find the pitfalls that we already found. Like if exactly. we step in the go puddle, find new ones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't step in the ones that we already found. We, go, we'll, go find we'll be new ones. disappointed if you find our problems over again. Right. Go go find new ones and report back. Like, you know, yeah, and, let, and then let's solve them together. And yeah, let's, yeah. that's how this gets better. Like I love that idea of doing it. The, the more this gets done, the more everybody becomes accustomed to it. Like I think a yeah. lot of what, when Jim and I go on site to support a show, it's really about training. It's yeah. not that like we're this isn't the thing that we're going to build our income and our career off of. This is a an intermediary step between the next thing we go working on. So we're really invested in getting everybody up to speed and understanding it and being able to uh, ask really smart questions that we can't answer. But we just know who to go ask. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's go to the next question. Next question comes in from uh Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida, he says, will Zoom ever support HDR? I'll, I'll, I'll grab onto that one. Probably not. Question for um, it, it doesn't make it doesn't make a lot of sense for Zoom to pass it over WebRTC, uh, you know, to that. Now, what I w the way we're doing it here for the test that we're doing and where we'll eventually go to is every one of the panelists in the in our test environment right now goes into an FS HDR. So we've got uh, four FS HDRs. And so 20 or 16 inputs go into it. And in there, we can either use the LUTs that are there. Right now, we're using um, the 
uh, color front live because we can we need to adjust a lot in the <laughs> we need all the dials in there so we're doing a color front um, conversion and then dialing in everybody and we actually built a web interface that lets us that anybody in the world can like jump in and just run those fs's um, to make those corrections um, so that's what we're working on on our end um, and pe people will see more of that as we go into june uh, next question well i would say we'll be happy to like we're very close with the color front team Bill Bowen oh, and Aja, and they're actually, it, there's a, this may be leading on the, I may have cheated, and I think you have a Tetra <laughs> question coming up. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> see, yeah, this that's... is what happens when you give us the power to see the questions. This, I, <laughs> as a presenter, this has been the best, one of the best experiences that I've had from like working with the whole audience and submitting questions. Like you, this is, this is phenomenal. Um, so the, the team at Aja has been working with uh, Nick and Pablo at Col uh, Colorama out in the UK. And they actually have a, a function you'll see now is called the Orion Convert. And so that there's a question about tetrahedral versus trilinear. Yeah, Bo, Bo Cordell mm -hmm. asked the next question, which is what Let is me... the difference between trilinear and tetrahedral interpolation? So when you have a LUT, a LUT has, you know, you can have different types of LUT. There's a 16-point LUT, a 33-point LUT, a 66-point LUT. It, those are just most standard is a 33 point cube blood. And, and most of these, when we say a cube blood, that's the trilinear because it's just the axes, basically the red, green, and blue axes just go out and they, and you're just moving the, the, basically the curves in three dimensions, right? So my understanding is how it does the math between mm -hmm. trilinear and tetrahedral mm -hmm. um, and how it interpolates. Cause like, say there's 33 points. Everything in between those points has to be interpolated by the math in the back end processing. Yeah. And my understanding is the tetrahedral is far more precise than the trilinear. Right. And of course, because engineers are engineers, they've gone and found out that doing this, I think, in floating point is even more precise. And so there's a yeah. product inside the Aja ecosystem right now called Orion Convert. And I think that you may start to see that other places and they're doing this, uh, all the conversion and floating point and um, they can achieve more uh, precision. But I think the other way we're looking at that is the biggest hurdle, like Jim mentioned earlier, is making sure like say your FSHDR is set up correctly. There was a time several years ago that we had to load these LUTs in the FSHDRs every time you wanted to use them. And you had to set what range the LUT worked in and whether, you know, is it zero to 100 or, you know, what zero meant is black at zero is black at 64. And you get all that wrong and it all comes wrong on the other side. So that's that's still a struggle with LUTs and the interoperability and making sure you get all the correct settings in the right places and what may be a fun uh advantage to Orion Convert if it, you know, transcends and gets to multiple devices is you can use this one, one file that works everywhere that you get the correct conversion and the rest of it happens in the background. Like they've people with, you know, film and other backgrounds or CLI, there's like, there's all kinds of other stuff that tried to implement with ACES and, and it's like, there's still no easy way to say like, this is the thing I have. This is the lot I apply to it. We can't get the nomenclature between nominal, full range. Uh, you know, it's just like, it's a mess. So um, that would be a, you know, we could potentially get, you know, Pablo involved and, and Nick, and they could give you guys a presentation on Orion Convert and what they're doing. And you're muted, yep. which is something I normally do. <laughs> I'm, I'm in a remote space. I usually have a hardware. I have a studio technologies like hardware mic one at home, and I keep on reaching for it, and it's not there. Um, the um, uh, the uh, um, yeah, we would love to have folks on. We'll we'll, we'll talk to you, uh, you know, between shows, but yeah. we would do this every month if we could, you know, just to just to have, you know, just keep touching on different parts of this puzzle because I think that we're covering it, it all kind of in this wide range. But we could talk probably spend a whole whole hour talking about just shading, you know, and just graphics and just yeah, and, and just these. I, I want to add, I can, I can, there, if I can, um, I can uh, arrange to be at a facility, either NAP or a rental house yeah. that has cameras and a camera chain set up or even maybe a truck set up and i can be set up remote from there and we can do some live shading yeah. live demonstration and flip around through different lots and different That'd shading be ideas be amazing L let's let's see if we can get it a couple more questions before the end of the hour uh, next question is also from bo go ahead um courtney 
Kirschner from Boca Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina. What's the best way to handle graphics in an HDR workflow? I don't think, I mean, I guess I'll pick on Bo because he is, he works for a graphics company, but like, I don't know that we have a best way right now. We're pretty much taking SDR graphics and converting them to HDR. We've done that for many years. It's been successful. It's been working. We then started around World Cup with one of our colleagues playing with some highlight expansion on graphics. And how do you add a little bit of pop to those graphics? I think the next step is starting to give tools to our our graphics teams to be more creative so that they can create in HDR space. So, you know, but that then drives a conversation. Do you want to let them create in 2020? Do I mean you kind of touched on it earlier, Alex, is like a shading workflow. And we we traditionally use the workflow where we, we have a predictive down cover is what we call it. So working with the operators here, we work in HDR and then they see what the resulting SDR is. So like on a post where they're grading, they'll have an HDR and SDR monitor side by side, uh, similar to what J uh, Jim shows you on that X-Series display, but say those are X310s or the new 30, you know, whatever those displays are. So you can see and you can make creative decisions and understand how they uh, play in both spaces. Right. And I think that we haven't done that in graphics yet. And graphics is pretty much so being constrained. Well, and, and part that of will the, drive. Sorry, that'll drive the conversation. Of like, do we give graphics the ability more dynamic range? Do we give them more color range? Do they have the ability to constrain things? Like we talked about the commercial stuff. If somebody yeah. delivers a, a Coke logo, I wouldn't want them to push it out into 2020 space because we're still going to have some 709 deliverables. Right. And so the, the, you're the not going to want to be inconsistent. The big problem is that that heterogeneous, you have to get, it's like if, if everybody's not ready to go over, you can't have one group suddenly giving you quote unquote proper HDR footage because now that has to have an entirely new LUT that's applied to it as it goes into the system compared to everything else that you're getting, right? Yeah, it's been it's been fun on like some of the big shows. You get to like a Super Bowl and you have the halftime team who have spent a gazillion dollars on halftime. And they're like, oh, yeah, we work with this post house. They told us we could do it. And then we get some stuff and we're like, uh, guys, uh, we can't air this because this is what it's going to look like when it gets converted. And we'll get the, oh. So it's like, I think this it goes back to kind of our, our first part of the conversation of, it's all doable, but we have to be willing to take the time and energy to understand it yep. and, 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 and test it and play with it. And, and, and that's what, you know, that's what we're hoping to do for, for everyone is that once we get the show off the ground and get it to the HDR, you know, that we're, you know, over the summer is that we're doing it every day and we can just sit there and just like, well, we're just going to pile a new set of graphics in or a new way of doing this or, or whatever. And we can just test it for the next three weeks, you know, or the next month or, or, and, and as it works, we just figure it, you know, figure it out. But that's, again, the reason we're taking a crazy little show and, and, <laughs> and stretching it out. I, yeah, I think there's a, a big issue with the graphics world is there the lack of kind of standards for high dynamic range in the graphics composition world. Yeah. There, there, we don't have a lot, you know, there's very few computer monitors that are kind of uh, suited for that. And I haven't seen, I haven't played with Photoshop in HDR recently, but there's no, there's no real graphics workflow for that unless you come in to go right into Resolve or Adobe Premiere. Right, right. Yeah. And I think that those, you know, there, and there, there are settings, you know, there are outputs in a variety of different things, but they're not very well developed, you know, so you can go into some of these and they've kind of turned on HDR settings, but the only one that I find is particularly uh, precise is Resolve, you know, Resolve color is their thing. And so, so we can set things up in color and look at them in, in Resolve, but they have to kind of start. Now, a lot of times what we're doing when we're doing 3D renders for some of the tests that we're doing right now is really high bit depth so I can do whatever I want. <laughs> I can I can run it out at 16 bit, you know, output and then bring it into resolve and then find what looks good before I deliver it out is, you know, I can I have all the bits there to move the, the color where it needs to go in resolve which, to output the output the graphic. Would absolutely and when we've done some like feature shoots, that's exactly how we've worked. We've let them work in S log, they come to resolve to, you know, do their color grade. But in that color grade, we've made sure that they have two broadcast displays, one in yep. HDR, one with the predictive. They've made some really cool creative decisions that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to make sure you empower your creatives to work. Yeah, yeah. I see some other good questions, so let's toss let's, it over. Yeah, let's go to next, next question. Uh, maybe we just covered it, but this one comes from Tlaloc, uh, uh 
Lopez Waterman in uh, Galisto, New Mexico. He says, what will creating graphics in HDR look like? What do you think will be the difference if you if you start seeing a I mean, regardless of whether we can or can't easily, what what do we think makes the difference if we started going down that path? I think it, you can make some stuff pop. You're not going to want like initially it was like, oh, we'll make the bug pop. And I was like, wait a second, that bug is supposed to sit up in the corner and just disappear. That's right, right, not, right. That's not supposed to pop. So I think I don't know that we have an answer till we start to empower the creatives like. A couple of years ago, all the graphics had stuff that ran around in a circle. Maybe that pops. But like now all the graphics are very, you know, very flat. They're very UI-esque. Graphics transition and kind of have a life and evolve through, you know, through the rest of the world. So I don't know that we have an answer until we start to empower them to play with it and then see what they can do. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a lot like anything else, like even like 3D, the early, early days of 3D, where every shot had to have all kinds of 3D elements to it. And then as they kind of evolved, they made it kind of everything kind of flat until you want to accent mm -hmm. something. Same thing with surround sound. You don't have the, the surrounds full blast, full level for your entire program or, or else everybody gets exhausted. You right. want to leave that and the immersive stuff for, for accents. Next question. Next question comes in from Bill Davis here on the panel, San Diego. Apple famously adopted a managed color pipeline for their devices years ago that keeps all devices in the same color handling model. Will we ever get anything similar for use across companies in the wider industry? So it's funny, Jim touched on this earlier, and practically there is, you know, there's VPID data that rides that will tell the displays how to interpret it. As mentioned, Apple's done a good job, and I, I'm betting, you know, we probably, if we have time, Jim can actually pull it up that if you have a QuickTime that has the correct metadata on it and are sitting in front of, I mean, I think I'm a little spoiled. I have an XDR display on my desk. You can put them up side by side, but even if you have a MacBook Pro, one of the new ones with the XDR displays, it will actually display, you know, take this BT2111 test bars and it will put, you know, graphic white at 75%, the peak white at 100%, and it will interpret that metadata back to like, you have to be very careful with metadata. Like Jim chased down a problem uh, at one of those football shows that without metadata, a vendor made a decision to do things that, and with the metadata, they made a different decision. And we, it was just like, what did you guys decide and why? Like, don't, don't do that. <laughs> so you, it goes back to you just, it it's testing right you have to check that entire pipeline and unfortunately the vendors are seeing the same thing we're seeing everywhere else and it just everybody is resource strapped right and they're doing the best they can with what they got um right. but do we as a community all have to work together to ensure that we're getting it where it needs to be and like they they acknowledged the problem we had a couple calls and you know then they fixed it and broke three other things you, you wouldn't expect anything different exactly. grass valley would never do that i see i wasn't gonna throw them under the bus <laughs> next question coming in from uh, douglas carmichael and he says for a uh, large international broadcast do you use an HDR pipeline and send out an SDR feed, or do you send out multiple HDR feeds? So generally, you know, Jim touched on it before. We really need to move to a, what we're calling the single master HDR workflow, where you create an HDR, and at the very end, you derive any derivatives from that from where you need to go. So uh the cost of additional transport has never had everybody had this utopia that bandwidth and everything was going to get cheaper it has not gained cheaper that you know the vendors in that space have constricted there's now less vendors less competition i don't foresee it uh getting cheaper so i think we're just kind of is what it is at the moment and we gotta be really efficient with how we use our bandwidth how we use our compression and uh we we can't like we used to run side by side production. We have an HDR truck and an SDR truck. Right. Uh, like we're just struggling to crew the trucks as it is. That's a whole other issue. Like we, there's just not enough people who want to be camera operators or TDs or replay operators to even crew the productions we're trying to run every week here. Well, um, that gets back to like training, which is that I think there's a lot of people that would love to do it, but no one knows how to get in, how to be the right person to be in the truck. We were just talking about this earlier in the week is just the, how do we ramp people up? 
I send them like Jim and I would love to teach them and send them off. Like the, I think we're, we're unfortunately at a point where there's more things that we're asked being asked to help with than we have time in the day to help with. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we would, you know, if you have those people in the pipeline, like we've reached out to colleges, like we just, we got to get that pipeline. Going. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about another, another time, but we'll, we'll get into that because that's what this whole organization is designed to be is a huge, feeder system for production. So, um, so awesome. I mean, along with us do, figuring it out is how do we get everyone ready and up to speed so that people like you can use them. So we'll definitely talk more about that off, offline. Uh, next question. Next question comes in from Tlaloc Lopez Waterman in Galisto, New Mexico. He says, you mentioned specialty cameras. What are the ones you typically spec? I guess it depends. I don't know. There's a, we'll have to dig into that more. There isn't like a, a specialty camera that you're like, this is the one you spec. I think it depends on what the specialty is. Are you doing aerial? Are you flying stuff on a four point system? Are you doing, you know, something in the dirt like we've seen in baseball? Are you like, it depends on where it's mounting and what the, the storytelling is. Are they, uh, you know, are they in the pylons for football? Are they under the ice? It's, at the end of the day, it's really about storytelling. So you you look at what that is and then what the best tool you can put in there. Uh, Michael and Jim, uh, we, it's so great to have you. Just amazing to have you for an hour. We could do this all day. Like, like we literally, <laughs> um, it's clear that you could do it all day. And so I think the only way to solve this is to have you guys back. So if you're, if you're open to it, we'll bring you back pretty often. Jim, I'd love to take you up when lighting up a truck or getting into a studio. We even have a... We can even work with you on, you know, I have a, I, my offices are in the old ILM 3210 stage. So there's state, I have a stage okay. and things connected. And so we can figure out what that, what that needs to look like, or we can work with you on something. If you have a space to, to use it in and Michael, of course, it'd be just, it'd be just great to have you and both, both of you, you know, and, and your friends go ahead and bring your friends over. Um, <laughs> we would, yeah, so uh, we, yeah. Why don't we all, why don't like offline and from your community start to get an idea of the different topics and maybe yeah. we can design a little bit of like, instead of like we were super broad today and covered yeah, yeah. the nuts, maybe we can like start to get into some very specific topics and spend an hour on this, an hour on that. And yeah, absolutely. Maybe, well, offline, why don't we just, we'll talk and we'll throw some ideas out Fantastic. and then we can, we're happy to help set some stuff up. That's great. That's great. It's going to make such a huge difference in the testing that we're doing and what we're trying to get off the ground and the training that we're doing to have someone who's like you spent a couple, you guys have, have spent some time in the trenches trying to figure this out. It'll save us a lot of time on, on what we're doing. So um, hopefully yeah. we'll be able to return the favor over time. Just so. like, there are hundreds of slides that you didn't even have to look at today in presentation. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that they'll be useful. They'll be useful in the next, in the next one. So, uh, so, so thanks so much for your, th thanks again for the, for the time that you, uh, that you gave us here today. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks for, for having us. Yeah, really, really great. Um, thanks to the panelists, of course, uh, for the first hour and the second hour. I can't do this without you. Thanks to the producers who asked all the questions. Uh, so that was, that was a great set of questions. Um, and there's a, you know, and thanks to the incredible team. There's every day, seven days a week, there's a small village that lights up to make this, this show happen. We've got the developers. We've got the folks that are organizing the, the subjects and, and the process and even managing the questions. And, and then we have the live team from all over the world that's running this show uh, seven days a week. So just thank you so much for, for all of your effort. Uh, we traveled 65,000 miles today answering these questions, 105,000 kilometers, and that's 521 million bananas for scale. All right, uh, let's go ahead and jump into After Hours. Have their truck in Cine gear. You know, I'm, I'm I'm from Pittsburgh, so I know exactly where we can get a truck. <laughs> Harmerville. There's, this is the whisper room. It's afterwards, we just oh, it's the whisper, whisper under the credits. This is gonna be the, all right. All right, credits. credits.